Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to our presentation in such an early morning. Um, my name is Miu Chong Yan. Um, I'm a professor at the School of Social Work, the University of British Columbia, and I'm also the PI, the principal investigator of this project. Um, today, uh, we're going to present, actually yesterday we have two wonderful workshops. My colleagues told me that they present some of the findings uh, of the project. And today we're going to present a focus uh, on the how labor houses as a capacity building mechanism for immigrants. So we will have uh, three different presentations. I will first outline the project and then I will invite my colleague Sean Nowers to present some findings from a survey we did with uh, uh, the surface user of labor houses. Uh, and after that, I will also present some findings about two other research activities we have done. Um, and, and then we'll invite our colleagues, uh, Karen Nakun and also Shelly um, George. Georgie, yeah, uh, from uh, South Vancouver Labor House to talk about a specific program they have done, uh, how they really use the program to connect uh, seniors. So for those who have never been to Vancouver, um, one thing you may want to know is uh, we are really the hub of labor houses. Altogether, they have, you know, we used to have 15 labor houses in the Metro Vancouver area. Unfortunately, one closed down a few years ago. Uh, in the middle of our project. So now we have 14 neighbor houses and they all spread out in the, uh, we call the um, Metro Vancouver areas. Most of them are in the city of Vancouver. So as you can see, uh, most of them are, oh, actually I forgot I have these things. So most of the labor houses here on this side uh, are in the city of Vancouver. And these are in the uh, Surrey area, and this is in the uh, Burnaby Labour House in the Burnaby area, and one in the Loft Shore. So altogether, we have 14 labour houses, and they are all, you know, working with us on this project. So this project uh, basically is the first systematic study of labour houses in Canada. So labour houses in Canada have been around for over 100 years, uh, but so far we don't really have one systematic study about them. Um, so this is the first one we have. It's a four years project funded by the you know, Canadian uh, Social Science and Humanity Research Council. But what, what I want to emphasize is this is a truly collaborative project. Uh, from the beginning of the proposal writing to the end, now you know, we are doing all the uh, data analysis and dissemination all along. Okay, we have a re research advisory committee uh, with you know, members from the few uh, labor houses joining us, you know, give us you know, idea, and we're on and on trying to communicate with our colleagues in the labor houses, make sure that we are not doing something too ivory tower. Okay, we want to make sure everything we do have a meaning to, you know, to the few. Um, so we have a, a very long research question, and it, it sounds very theoretical. We need this question because we need the funding. Uh, if we don't write something complicated, okay, the funder may not understand what we want to do. Uh, so that's what we put it up. Um, so if you want to know more about the project, this is the uh, website. Uh, you can always log on. All the presentation we have done so far and you know, will be done today uh, will be uploaded to our website in, you know, probably in two weeks' time. So if you want to you know, get our information about the findings, please do try to log on to it. And I'll just give you a very you know, quick look at what we have done. Okay? In the four years, we have 11 different research activities. So it means we collect data from you know, different people. Altogether, you know, the study has involved close to 1,000 people. Uh, with at least 600 people from surface users. So we are not just looking at you know, the staff, uh, people who are actively involved in the management, in the leadership of labor houses. We also talk to people, the government people, and most importantly, uh, we also talk to people who use the services. So we want to gather you know, from different perspectives, how do they look at labor houses in Metro Vancouver, what, they have, what have they done, and uh, well, you know, which is, you know, what are the strengths and you know, what are the you know, process, something like that, okay? So without further ado, I will invite my colleagues, uh, Sean Lowers, to give a presentation on his um, finding. Yeah, great. <laughs> Okay. Hello. <coughs> Hello. Sorry. I might try to. Oh. I might try to 
walk around just to interact with my slides a bit, so I'll see how that goes anyway. Uh, so I'm Sean Lauer, I'm from University of British Columbia. Maybe I'll just take a minute to say um, what a, a nice experience it is for me uh, being uh, working at a university, but to have the opportunity to, colla to collaborate with neighborhood houses. I think it's, uh, uh, for anybody out there who's thinking about that possibility, I think of uh, either academics interested in uh, thinking, considering that possibility, I've just recommended it. it's been really uh, valuable to me. And then maybe if there's any um, community uh, uh, organizations out there who are considering that possibility, just uh, just say what a great uh, what a great thing I think it is, and it can be really hopefully really rewarding for you as well too. So, so I want to talk a little bit today. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview of my presentation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the context of my research and how I think about um, working with neighbor, the kind of questions I'm interested in working with neighborhood houses. Then I want to tell you about a survey research project uh, that Mew introduced uh, that we did with uh, participants at the neighborhood houses. And particularly, I just want to, that, that project, just to tell you the punchline at the beginning, um, is that uh, we sh um, we're finding that uh, participation in neighborhood houses, it, it uh, increases social capacity development among people who are participating at the neighborhood house. And that's particularly true for uh, newcomers to Canada, so it seems like uh, that seems to be a particularly true finding for, uh, strong finding for newcomers to Canada. And then after that, I want to tell you a little bit about um, uh, a kind of little empirical puzzle that I find interesting. It's about styles of participation and some different kinds of uh, outcomes that are related to different kinds of styles of participation that uh, I hope you find interesting too. So uh, for a long time now, I've been interested in how uh, participation in neighborhood houses can uh, contribute to uh, the social capacity development of neighborhood house users. Uh, so a couple different things about that I've been interested in, thinking about how um, participation in neighborhood houses can lead to uh, integration with other individuals in uh, the neighborhood and in the wider society. Uh, how participation, oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. I have a tendency to talk a little bit quickly, so uh, I don't mind being reminded to talk slowly. I apologize. <laughs> Well, I'm going to try and think of some tricks to make myself uh, speak slowly. I apologize. <laughs> So uh, for, uh, I was saying that I've always been interested in how participated, participation in neighborhood houses can contribute to the development of social capacity. And there's a few things along those lines that I can, there are a few, hello, there are a few uh, aspects of that that have always been interesting to me. Um, one is how participation in neighborhood houses can lead to uh, uh, developing relationships and integrating uh, individuals with uh, people in the neighbor, making connections, but also integration in the wider society. Uh, also how um, participation in neighborhood houses can allow people to to develop certain kinds of skills and capacity through uh, participation, the kinds of experiences they have participating. And I've also been interested in how uh, participation in neighborhood houses can lead to different kinds of recognition for people, the kind of contributions people make in their community, both formal and informal kinds of recognition that can come from uh, that kind of participa participation. Uh, I think this slide maybe is uh, something that uh, is everyone is familiar with, but it's interesting to me. Uh, the things that I think are really uh, valuable about the kind of work that neighborhood houses do that contribute to these kinds of uh, questions I'm asking, one is that they're geographically based, and so that they're, uh, or they're organized around a local community. So rather than individual characteristics, it's based on a kind of geographic uh, organizing strategy uh, that I think um, uh, has uh, an impact on the kinds of people who participate and the kinds of participation that take place. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about uh, neighborhood houses is the uh, variety of ways people can participate. So people can come and uh, uh, take part in an activity or, or use a service of some kind, but there are also opportunities for people to uh, uh, initiate programs, uh, help lead or manage programs and those kinds of things as well. And there are also uh, opportunities for people to engage in uh, more sort of deliberative discussions and, del and kind of governance opportunities within neighborhood houses as well. And, and all these varieties of uh, styles of participation or types of participation that people can have, uh, I think, are, make them unique and interesting for the kinds of questions I find interesting. Uh, they're also uh, multi-service organizations, so they are doing a variety of different kinds of, uh, providing a variety of different kinds of services to a variety of different kinds of people. And, and because of this multi-service uh, approach, it attracts lots of different kinds of, uh, kinds of people to the organizations, and that also makes them quite interesting to me for these kinds of research questions I'm interested in. 
So I want to tell you today about a survey research project that we're, we're working on. Uh, we uh, did a survey, uh, a survey of uh, uh, neighborhood house users at all 14 neighborhood houses that Mew mentioned earlier. Uh, we uh, collected a total of 675 responses to that, uh, to that survey from all 14 different neighborhood houses. Uh, you can see from the slide that there are a large number of newcomers who are part of our, our uh, sample. It's also true of the uh, people who use neighborhood houses. Also a large number of women who are part of our sample, which is also true of neighborhood houses. Um, I should mention that the survey itself includes a lot of different, um, uh, we ask questions about a lot of different kinds of things from the ways people participate to uh, relationships within neighborhoods, the kinds of activities people engage in in their neighborhoods, uh, the kinds of um, uh, kind of uh, other, other things that people do in their neighborhoods as well, so other kinds of activities and other kinds of individual characteristics. Uh, but today I want to focus particularly on just a set of four questions about social capacity. So we actually, on that, in that questionnaire, we asked people, uh, for, for uh, about um, the extent to which they saw their uh, different kinds of skills, their own self-reported uh, change in their skills through involvement in neighborhood houses uh, based on these four uh, items. So one of them was about um, working with people from uh, different backgrounds than their own, one about decision-making decision -making abilities, about organizing and managing events or programs, those kinds of things, and also speaking in front of others. Uh, I should mention, I think it's uh, always important to mention that um, survey research is by design a bit um, shallow kind of, right? Like, so we can't really get into, use, get into a depth of understanding about of these kinds of uh, changes that people might have experienced in a, in a survey. It's not really possible there. Uh, so, but uh, I can just say that my colleagues will talk a little bit more about that, the kinds of things that, uh, the depth of those kinds of things that happen day to day in a neighborhood house. But in survey research, we have to do, be a bit shallow. That's kind of a, it's one of the, uh, the costs of doing this type of research. So just get quickly to findings. Uh, bear with me for a second. Hello. So if you look at the table, you can see, um, I just listed here on the left-hand side the, diff the four different questions that uh, we we're asking about um, working with others, decision-making, organizing events, those types of things. Uh, you can see them on the left-hand side. And then as we move to the right, you can see some, just right away, some of our initial findings about uh, social capacity development. So in the first two columns, um, we, you can see the uh, percentage of people who said that they saw that these uh, skills increased a little or a lot through their involvement in neighborhood houses. And so, for instance, in the first box there, 42% of people said that their ability to work with people from different backgrounds increased a little. Uh, and so you can follow that down through there. And if you look through those first two columns, the, maybe the one thing that jumps out at you is that just in general, everyone is reporting increases uh, in these skills, these particular skills. So overall, it looks like uh, it, uh, people find that the participation in neighborhood houses leads them to increase in, increased uh, development in these particular skills that we're asking about. If you move to the right then, uh, this is the question that was sort of motivating the, this particular research, was uh, asking about whether or not there are differences with, uh, between people born in Canada and people born outside Canada. And so uh, as an example, uh, maybe the, uh, just as an easy one, we could start at the bottom here, just to, I can come closely to pointing to it. You can see that 22% um, of uh, people born in Canada said that they uh, reported a little bit of increase in their ability to speak in front of others, and 19% said they saw that uh, increase a lot. So that's for people born in Canada. And, and then if you look to the next two columns, that's where you see that we can start to see differences between people who are born in Canada and outside of Canada. So for instance, 22% of people born in Canada said they saw a little bit of an increase, whereas 42% of people who were born outside of Canada saw a little increase. And then 19 saw a big increase and 32% saw a big increase. So you can see uh, just in this initial table, just a simple set of percentages, you can see that there really were some uh, big differences between the reports of increase in these kind of capacity uh, uh, development skills that uh, I was interested in. And if you look at, uh, if you look at all four rows uh, there, you can see that actually those patterns hold up across all four of those rows. So uh, right off the bat then, that kind of gives us a sense that, um, that the neighborhood houses actually are having an impact on capacity development, and particularly uh, increased impact on capacity development for people who are born outside of Canada. 
Uh, maybe it's a bit uh, of uh, a bit of a professor for a minute, but um, uh, one thing you, what's possible is that uh, when we look at a, just a simple percentages like this, it's always possible that maybe these differences could be uh, due to some other factors potentially. And, and in this research in particular, we sort of going into the research thinking that participation in the neighborhood houses would lead to these kind of capacity development uh, improvements. And so there is the possibility then that maybe people who are born outside Canada are participating more and it's actually a result of that participation that we're seeing the differences between people born inside Canada and outside Canada. And it's not actually that they're newcomers, it's just that they're participating in a, uh, more in a different way than the non-newcomers. And so uh, we have just simple techniques for trying to deal with that. So uh, it's a big table with lots of numbers, I apologize for that. But the main point of this table actually is just looking at some simple multivariate models where we can control for some important factors that might be confounding or spurious kind of factors that might be uh, potential alternative explanations for why we see this difference between, um, between uh, newcomers and non-newcomers. So you'll see the variables on the left-hand side, and I'll just point out quickly that um, there's a variables of length, intensity, and variety, which are uh, different uh, ways people could be involved in the neighborhood house, and I'm going to refer to them in, uh, in a couple minutes again. But for right now, I think I just want to draw your attention to this bottom row here, where we have a, a positive value of 0.355 with a few uh, stars there that signify that these are uh, powerful findings or significant findings. And, and basically what this, the main thing, if we just look in that bottom right hand corner, the main thing it's telling me or telling us is that uh, even controlling for important factors, including uh, participation in the neighborhood, different kinds of participation in neighborhood houses, uh, the difference between newcomers and non-newcomers is still strong, it's still maintaining itself. So just a, just a key wrap up of key findings, uh, a first stop on the way, actually I have one more thing I'd like to tell you after this. But just starting off first, we can see that it looks like that there's, um, we do see some reports, uh, self-reported increase in social cap capacity development through participation in neighborhood houses. And then we also do see that newcomers uh, have larger increases in social capacity development than non-newcomers, and that that relationship seems to be holding up even when we control for other important kinds of factors. So uh, just right off, it seems like we have some evidence that it seems like the, the participation in neighborhood houses has particular value for newcomers. Okay, so if you just uh, would indulge me for a minute, I'd like to just tell you a bit about um, something I find interesting, just thinking about styles of participation and different ways people could participate in organizations like neighborhood houses. And there, obviously there's a lot of, uh, uh, you could do a, this in a lot of different ways as well, so you, there's a lot of um, uh, approaches you could take to trying to, to talk about these different styles of participation. But I'd like to use just three very simple ideas. Uh, one of them is just uh, tenure or the length of time that people are participating. One of them is intensity or how frequently or how regularly people come to the neighborhood house. And the last one is the scope of participation or what is the sort of variety of things people might do at the neighborhood house, uh, the variety of programs and activities they might participate in. So something interesting I'm finding about the, this social capacity development idea is that uh, the, looking at these three variables, or these three concepts about how people could participate, uh, I'm kind of calling this uh, the approach that seems to be most uh, uh, valuable for uh, having a, um, an impact on social capacity development. I'm calling it a varied style approach. It's one where um, uh, the length of, of participation is not particularly important. The length of time people participate is not particularly important. So whether you are particular for a long time or not a, long, uh, a short time or a long time, uh, the capacity development doesn't change is similar for those types of people, for those people. Uh, as people's intensity of involvement changes, uh, actually, sorry, I'm going to switch to a, I have a little fancy graph, it's a bit easy for me to, to describe that way. So if you look at tenure or length, you can see that uh, over time as tenure increases, there's actually not a very strong or not very big change in the amount of capacity development. If you look at this line at the bottom here, it's looking at intensity, the red one, you can see that as intensity increases, there is an increase in capacity development. I think that makes sense if you think about this kind of experience of these skills are things that people learn and, and practicing and the intensity of that practicing and working is kind of important. But I think the thing that shows up uh, that's most dramatic in this graph is the impact of scope or the variety of things that people are participating in. And it's really the variety that's having the biggest impact on, um, on how much uh, social capacity development there is uh, in the, as uh, we're finding in the neighborhood houses. 
Uh, as a comparison, I think I'd like to just point out to you uh, another project that I worked on, actually Mew and I worked on in the past, and that one's about developing cross-ethnic ties or cross-ethnic friendship ties. And in that one, uh, it's a survey of about 30, 351 newcomers. It was all newcomers in that particular project. And in that one, we found a slightly different combination. So in that one, we found what I'm calling a targeted style of participation. So in that situation, it was shorter uh, tenure or a shorter long length of time of participation that led to um, more uh, cross-ethnic ties. Intensity was still important, so the intensity of participation increasing increased the amount of cross-ethnic ties and friendship people developed. But interestingly, the scope was a different, uh, had a different kind of relationship. It was actually a limited scope or a focus on particular types of programs and rather than this broader varied approach that, um, that had an impact on cross-ethnic tie formation. And so that's kind of interesting to me because you can start to think that with these very simple uh, ideas of participation, length, intensity, and scope, and the ways they combine will have potentially be associated with different kinds of outcomes. So we can start to kind of get, get into a bit the different ways people participate and the different kinds of outcomes that are associated with those styles of participation. Uh, so just wrapping up our key findings, so self-reported, uh, again, reminding us self-reported social capacity development does increase uh, through participation in neighborhood houses. Uh, newcomers are reporting more of those increases than social capacity development uh, than those born in Canada. And then it seems that this varied approach to participation in uh, uh, neighborhood houses is the key factor that kind of can kind of understand, that can, we can see leading to this kind of social capacity development. Thank you. Thank you for my patience. I tried to talk slowly. I hope that was good. <laughs>